Welcome, friends, readers, listeners, and viewers from across America and around the world. I thank all of you for joining me in fellowship today on this Sabbath. It is a glorious day outside today here in Georgia, um, near Athens, Georgia. We're on the East Coast, United States of America, and it is beautiful outside. Sunshiny, blue skies, just a very light breeze. Uh, I spent the day outside reading over the new release of my latest book, Skyfall, the seventh uh, in this ongoing series. And I've already endeavored to begin a couple more, um, one focused on the end of days, the destroyer, and another on differentiating Christ, uh, which will cover a lot of the infancy stories and the stories of his childhood and a lot of scriptures that are connected to the revelation of who he was and the special significance and importance of his coming into the flesh and also his pre-existence with the Father. And with all of these various things that not a lot of people have been able to piece together and put together in such way, I'm hoping to embellish upon those particular topics and themes. And I just pray that, you know, I have time to finish these books and get them out to you and to provide to you, again, a, a massive amount of work and a myriad compilation of various texts uh, as far as the um, the full summation of all these different things that have been disjointed and how they parallel each other to bring forth what I believe is the fuller picture on what's going on with the end of days and how the destroyer as Wormwood, Planet X, Nibiru, the, the various um, connotations and associations that are linked to it and how it will play a role within what is the end of days. Um, uh, I'm working diligently on that. And another thing also to let the listening audience know, I am, I, and I have been asked by many of you to provide, especially those of you that have gone through the archives and that heard on the various shows where I have offered the the different Targum texts, which is uh, a word meaning translation, and that uh, during the time when the Hebrews were exiled to Babylon and taken to the exile, Jeremiah, the scribe Baruch, and the various peoples that were alive during his time, before the 70 years were up and they were allowed by Cyrus and Darius uh, of the Persian Empire to go back into the land and to recreate and to reform nation of Israel um, and to reestablish the temple, they had become assimilated into the various peoples and languages that were found then in those parts of the world. And the Torah, the original Torah, which was written in Hebrew, and that was the language of the people for many, many years, um, the original language was lost. And that the Torah, the five books of Moses, the first books of the Old Testament, those books were were commissioned by Rabbi Eleazar, who was over the Jerusalem temple um, during the early period. He commissioned the Torah to be translated into the various languages of that time. And so these different language translations um, have arrived and have been kept and are now available. There are English translations of those translations, which the Hebrew was translated into Aramaic, Babylonian, uh, the language of the Palestinians, 
uh, during that time. And so we have these different what are called targums. And in my opinion, in reading them side by side with the text of the King James Version of the Bible, and I certainly am not able to read Hebrew, but uh, I wish that I could. But for those of us that can't, uh, it's interesting to read the translations of the translations English because they, in my opinion, provide greater detail on the what was the original Hebrew Torah, um, which seems to, um, you know, we, we don't have access to that r- right now, uh, besides what we have as far as the King James Version, the Septuagint, and um, the Pentateuch, uh, these other olden texts. But anyways, the reason I, I mention this is because I am putting together and compiling a book right now to provide these Targum translations to you because I just happen to have a copy and many of you are having difficulty finding them on the net and a lot of times when you do find them they are in partial form fragmented and you're not able to you know, read them in the way that this particular um, copy that I have, which is by J.W. Etheridge, and it's a 1862 translation, a copy of his previous work. And so I'm utilizing this particular text to format. I'm only formatting. I'm not, like, changing anything. Uh, I'm trying to be as least invasive as I can as far as the work that he's already done, but in the particular, um, the, the, um, the translations that I have, there are some form, you know, as far as formatting, there are some repeated sections, repeated chapters. Um, there are some ex- things that were excluded um, and there's, you know, some some corrections as far as uh, um, spelling, and 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 those things I I fixed. But wherever I could, I left it in the original context that he had done. And so this, I'm almost done with this. I have only yet remaining to do. Uh, is the writing of the introduction, and that I will be making um, in book form because that's another thing. You can't find these Targums in their entirety as far as the first five books. You can't find them in book form. And I think that, um, like myself, I like to read, especially these huge compilations of works, And this book is 497 pages already without the few other things I have to add. But um, you can't find it in book form. And I like to read outside uh, and not, you know, just from an electronic copy, which a lot of you own Kindles and things like that, and it makes it a lot easier. But um, I like to, you know, as I said, I like to read outside and I like to read print form. And so I am going to make this available. It should be within a month that it does become available to the public. And I will certainly let you know because, uh, it's again, my opinion that the work that J.W. Etheridge did in translating the Aramaic and also the Babylonian Targums into English is, you know, something of a massive treasure for the public that is not readily available and accessible. And so my hope is that um, that I can make this available to you because a lot of you are seekers of truth and you are trying to do similar research as myself and you have dedicated yourselves to reading all these various resources that I've been bringing forward. And so um, 
Yes, Jennifer, I can make a copy to you available to you. And those of you that are interested in it in its current electronic form, certainly email me through my website, zengarcia.com, and I will make that available to you. Um, Because, again, I think the work is invaluable and it adds to the 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 um the discernment that many of us have been blessed to share and through fellowship have become confirming witness for each other upon and and that being said um also I'd like to let all of you know that I have right now hardback copies of Skyfall my publisher had told me that I would receive both soft copies and hard copies uh, together, but that's not the case. And so I have sent him an email. I have not yet heard back, but should Monday. But as of right now, I do have 75. Well, I've already sent out a bunch of them. So um, I got, you know, like 50 copies of, of the hardback available and I am autographing those and making them available to you. Um, and I do appreciate those of you that have waited patiently for the release of this book. And in spending time today reading over it, you know, I, I don't want to boast in any kind of way, but I, I do think that it will help a lot of you as far as in in relating to our first estate and who we were. Um, before we came into our flesh embodiments. And those of you that are familiar with Jeremiah 1, uh, where, you know, the word of the Lord had told Jeremiah that I had, I knew you before you entered into the womb of your mother, and I had foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nations, that I used that as well as many other similar type of scriptures to elaborate upon pre-existence, predestination, and pre-election, which are the focus of my seventh book, Skyfall, the Angels of Destiny. Because we are them, and we were part, as it says in Psalms 82, we were part of the sons of God, the council of the mighty, um, the divine council, what I refer to as the morning star administration, and so all these things are elaborated upon in great detail, and and I answer a lot of the questions, which, in my opinion, not a lot of mainstream pastors and preachers, ministers, are able to do so um, because they don't have this this particular revelation, or if they do, they don't they. Um, they haven't maybe put together the way that because you have to really, in my opinion, again, you have to get the details of all the extra biblical, extra canonical texts to elaborate and elucidate these particular topics. And so I think this particular book does that in a very profound way and that it arms you as an individual seeker, as someone that is trying to confirm some of these things for yourself. It arms you with the source material, with the uh, the various quotes and passages from various chapters of Scripture found um, spread out and that span, you know, thousands of years and many, 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 many different texts. Uh, it puts it all into one place for you to be able then to go and, you know, confirm these things for yourself and to check out the source material for yourself and see if you arrive to similar conclusion. And so, but today, um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about what many have called the gap theory and the what is how the earth became null and void and what was the recreation and the reformation of the earth in the prior times? And and this was um, 
you know, leading to what and how our earth came to be in its current form and the beginning of the second world age, which there are other, you know, specific passages in the Old Testament, which also what I'm going to be talking about today. And the reason I wanted to kind of touch upon this topic today, even though for those that follow my other show Revolu- on Revolution Radio every Wednesday evening, 8 to 10 p.m., and I appreciate those of you that do, I covered this issue in great detail this particular Wednesday. And you can find that on my Facebook page as well as on my YouTube site under Endeavor Freedom. And also I've posted it on the Fallen Angels TV website. It's the latest Revolution Radio broadcast just this past Wednesday. But anyways, in that show I elaborated upon a lot of the things that I'm going to cover here, but I'm going to... I'm not going to repeat a lot of that um, because tomorrow evening I will be joining John the Baptist on tribulation-now.org on his radio program and his broadcast to discuss what was a, a debate that took place between Ken Ham, who was uh, he's the caretaker of the Creation Museum, and I don't remember exactly where that is, but and also Bill Nye, the science guy, and a lot of questions. Which and I, you know, I haven't even had chance to listen to that debate in its fullness. I've read articles about it, but I do plan on doing just that before the show takes place tomorrow. But um, today I'm going to cover just a little bit about what had happened and how. Genesis, in Genesis 1, in verse 1 and 2, there is inference to what I'm going to be talking about and to what we are going to be covering in that show as a round table. And that, um, and that for those of you that read you know, Genesis and you come to the second scripture where it says that the earth was null and void we know that the father and the son that initially when they had established the universe and the creation they had created it in fullness and that there was nothing lacking and why would they create something that was lacking and that um, you know was not complete and so a lot of you have questioned and have that similar introspection to, well, why was the earth null and void? And if they didn't create it as such, how did it become in such manner? And what resulted in the earth becoming null and void? And so we're going to pick up on that right now. And what I want to actually read first I want to share just a small passage, and this is from the Oasipi. It says this, and then I'm going to read from the Colburn Bible, because the Colburn Bible actually shares information and has a very detailed accounting as to this particular knowledge that, in fact, Genesis is referring to what was... um, Uh, a creation and a recreation. But before doing so, I'm going to share this with you. And these are things I didn't share in the Revolution Radio show. Uh, On that show, I don't read a lot of scripture, and I don't share a lot of the passages that I utilize in my books to verify the the, the things that I've come to discernment upon the revelations that I share with you in that show because it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically the only Christian show on an entire network of New Age um, hosts. Uh, I don't read a lot of scripture. I just tell people kind of how things are. And, you know, and I point to certain things 
but I don't, you know, I don't read a lot of biblical passages or even from, you know, other wisdom texts. I just kind of um, speak a lot, talk a lot, share a lot of dialogue and answer a lot of questions. Uh, but anyways, continuing, it says this from the the passage that I'm going to be reading from. It says, I looked over the wide heavens that I had made, and I saw countless millions of spirits of the dead that had lived and died on other corporeal worlds before the earth was made. I spake in the firmament, and my voice reached to the uttermost places. And there came an answer to the sounds of my voice, myriads of angels from the roadway in heaven where the earth traveleth. I said to them, Behold, a new world have I created. Come ye and enjoy it. Yea, ye shall learn from it how it was with other worlds in ages past. There alighted upon the new earth millions of angels from the heaven, but many of them had never fulfilled a corporeal life, having died in infancy. And these angels comprehended not procreation nor a corporeal life. Forgot to write down something that I wanted to share with you as well. And it's a, a book from X about the underground bases and about the fallen angels and how they, you know, had been here a long time ago and the structures they had created and everything. But in that particular, this one particular book, um, there's there's a, a, a person that is channeling information from one of these fallen angel spirits, and they're talking about how they had been on the old earth, the the earth that was referred to as Tiamat, Rahab, and Maldek, and how they had uh, created under underwater structures because the earth at that time was covered completely by one ocean and there was no land yet uh, available no land that you know protruded from uh, the ocean the covering of the ocean and also that like the outer planets of our solar system today um the there was a, a vaporous canopy there was a cloud bank uh, um Closure the that the earth was enclosed in clouds at that time, and you know there was not ability to see out from the surface of the earth because of that particular water canopy. All right, so keep that in mind when I read this. This is from the Colburn Bible. It says the destruction and recreation. And this will set the premise for what we're going to be covering in this particular show. And as I said, I'm not going to be reading a whole lot of scripture today, but I'm going to be kind of um, setting the premise for what we will be discussing in the show when I'm uh, joining John the Baptist tomorrow night for um, this roundtable discussion on the debate that Bill Nye and Ken Ham Shared And what was interesting is that he opened up the Creation Museum for this particular debate, and there were a thousand people in attendance. But little did they know, 800,000 people would join online and would watch, you know, this particular de debate unfolding. And so you can see that many people are interested in this particular topic and are curious from both sides, you know, scientific and biblical, as to how to reconcile differences and how to come to discernment on these particular issues. And so, it is known, and the story, and before I continue, just know that even what I'm reading from here, that these particular scriptures are thousands of years old. 
and that this information was passed down through the Egyptian priesthood as well as the the Celtic and the Druidic priesthood, and it has been um, reverenced by these particular cultures and these people for long, long, long period of time. And that it also cites and covers the prior times, talks about, you know, the fallen angels being here before humanity, all the stories, the biblical as well as, well as the Sumerian stories are contained within the Colburn Bible, which it's almost a thousand page text as well. I spent a whole summer reading this particular text. It is known, and the story comes down from ancient times, that there was not one creation but two, a creation and a recreation. It is a fact known to the wise that the earth was utterly destroyed once, and then reborn on a second wheel of creation. At the time of the great destruction of earth, God caused a dragon from out of the heaven to come and encompass her about. The dragon was frightful to behold. It lashed its tail. It breathed out fire and hot coals, and a great catastrophe was inflicted upon mankind. I'm going to stop here and just make quick commentary. The dragon being referred to here is actually the planet Nibiru, known as the Destroyer, because the Colburn Bible has several accountings of how this particular planet was involved in judgments that were brought upon the planet Earth as we now know it, and also the planet Earth before it became the new earth that we are now familiar with. And so um, in my new book, which will be coming up after this one, Skyfall, the one on the Destroyer and the End of Days, I will be sharing all of those accountings from the Colburn Bible, which detail the various times that it has been involved in these particular judgments because it's linked to the Exodus and also to the flood of Noah's day. And so, um, and also to the destruction of Atlantis. All right, continuing. The body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold, bright light. And beneath, on the belly, was a ruddy, hued glow while behind it trailed a flowing tail of smoke. It spewed out cinders and hot stones, and its breath was foul and stenchful, poisoning the nostrils of men. Its passage caused the great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick, darkened sky, all heaven and earth being made hot. The seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up, pouring across the land. There was an awful shrilling trumpeting which outpoured, outpowered even the howling of the unleashed winds. Men, stricken with terror, went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. They were loosed from their senses and dashed about, crazed, not knowing what they did. The breath was sucked from their bodies, and they were burnt with a strange ash. And then it passed, leaving earth enwrapped with a dark and glowering mantle, which was ruddily lit up inside. The bowels of the earth were torn open in great writhing upheavals, and a howling whirlwind rent the mountains apart. The wrath of the sky monster was loosed in the heavens. It lashed about in flaming fury, roaring like a thousand thunders, It poured down fiery destruction amid a welter of thick black blood. So awesome was the fearfully aspected thing that the memory mercifully departed from man. His thoughts were smothered under a cloud of forgetfulness. The earth vomited forth 
great gust of foul breath from awful mouths opening up in the midst of the land. The evil breath bit at the throat before it drove men mad and killed them. Those who did not die in this manner were smothered under a cloud of red dust and ashes or were swallowed by the yawning mouths of earth or crushed beneath crashing rocks. The first sky monster was joined by another which swallowed the tail of the one going before, but the two could not be seen at once. The sky monster reigned and raged above earth, doing battle to possess it, but the many-bladed sword of God cut them in pieces, and their falling bodies enlarged the land and the sea. I want to stop here for just a second as well. Uh, because in this book, Skyfall, I mean not Skyfall, in the book that I'm going to be doing on the end of days, where I'm bringing all these various um, scriptures together to help you to understand and discern what will be the end of days, and also um, the destroyer's part to play within it. Because you will notice in Revelation it talks about the the land and also the rivers and the lakes turning blood red and that one third you know that this wormwood would impact the oceans and one third of the ships would be destroyed um you know one third of the creatures in the seas destroyed and that that it would poison the waters and also how the skies would be turned uh, blackened and the moon would turn blood red well in the various passages and scriptures and some of these will be in the ones that I'm about to re be reading from but in the others it talks about when this particular pan, uh, planet passes close to us in proximity that it covers the earth in a red dust and that this red dust is what turns the the rivers and the lakes to this blood red, and it also poisons the waters and kills the creatures of the sea. And that um, it also, you know, causes these other signs within the heavens, the blood red moon, and you know, and also the the skies being darkened where the sun could, would would not penetrate through. And so there seems to be similarity with some of the previous passings of this particular planet and the destruction that occurred um, previously with those accountings that are written within Revelation and that give allusion to similar type of um, a similar type of judgment to be poured out on those not written into the book of life those that are excluded from the book of life and for whom the wrath of God will be poured out upon. All right, continuing. Oh, also I wanted to say that in that particular book that I'm putting together now, that in the Hopi prophecies, it speaks about, because it says in this particular passage that um, that the the first sky monster was joined by another which swallowed the tail of the one going before but the two could not be seen at once it says in the Hopi prophecies on the end of days as well that on the blue star and the red star of Kachina that there are going to be two bodies which cause this particular destruction a red Kachina and a blue Kachina and it's interesting to me that this particular passage refers to as this particular, you know, same kind of phenomena. And it's also stated that, you know, a lot of other planetary systems out there, that they are binary in aspect. And so it could be referenced to something similar. But anyways, continuing on. In this manner, the oh, and also know that I cover in this new book, 
I covered the Hopi prophecy, the last day's prophecy on the Blue Star, Red Star Patina in great detail and parallel it with the teachings that come out of the Colburn Bible that are connected to this as being the destroyer. In this manner, the first earth was destroyed by calamity descending from out of the skies. The vaults of heaven had opened to bring forth monsters more fearsome than that ever haunted, that ever haunted the uneasy dreams of men. Men and their dwelling places were gone. Only sky boulders and red earth remained where once there were. But amidst all the desolation, a few survived. For man is not easily destroyed. They crept out from caves and came down from the mountainside. Their eyes were wild and their limbs trembled. Their bodies shook and their tongues lacked control. Their faces were twisted and the skin hung loose on their bones. They were as maddened wild beasts driven into an enclosure before flames. They knew no law, and being deprived of all the wisdom they once had, and those who had guided them were gone, the earth's only true altar of God had offered up a sacrifice of life and sorrow to atone for the sins of mankind. Man had not sinned indeed, but in the things he had failed to do. Man suffers not only for what he does, but for what he fails to do. He is not chastised for making mistakes, but for failing to recognize and rectify them. Then the great canopy of dust and cloud, which encompassed the earth, enshrouding it in heavy darkness, was pierced by ruddy light. And the canopy swept down in great cloudbursts and raging storm waters. Cool moon tears were shed for the distress of earth and the woes of men. When the light of the sun pierced the earth's shroud, bathing the land in revitalizing glory, the earth again knew night and day, for there were now times of light and times of darkness. The smothering canopy rolled away and the vaults of heaven became visible to man. The foul air was purified and new air clothed the reborn earth, shielding her from the dark, hostile void of heaven. The rainstorm ceased to beat upon the face of the land and the waters stilled their turmoil. Earthquakes no longer tore the earth open nor was it burned and buried by hot rocks. The land masses were reestablished in stability and solidity, standing firm in the midst of the surrounding waters. The oceans fell back to assigned places, and the land stood steady upon its foundations. The sun shone upon the land and sea, and life was renewed upon the face of the earth. Rain fell gently once more, and the clouds of fleece floated across the day skies. The waters were purified, and the sediments sank, and life increased in abundance. Life was renewed, but it was different. Man survived, but he was not the same. The sun was not as it had been, and a moon had been taken away. Man stood in the midst of renewal and regeneration. He looked upon into the heavens above in fear of the awful powers of destruction lurking there. Henceforth, the placid skies would hold a terrifying secret. Man found, man found the new earth firm. And lived in dread that the heavens would again bring forth monsters and crash about him. And when men came forth from their hiding places and refuges, the world their fathers knew had had known was gone forever. Last paragraph. The face of the land was changed and earth was littered with rocks and stones which had fallen when the structure of heaven collapsed. One generation groped in the desolation and gloom and as the thick darkness was dispelled, 
Its children believed they were witnessing a new creation. Time passed, memory dimmed, and the record of events was no longer clear. Generation followed generation, and as the ages unfolded, new tongues and new tales replaced the old. All right. Now, what is interesting to me about this particular uh, story as told by the Colvin Bible is that it covers and speaks about all, you know, the canopy, the um, Nibiru and its influence, and also that moons had been lost. And these kind of things are also related in the story of the destruction of this particular planet as cited by the Enuma Elish. And not only the Enuma Elish, but there's a story in the Lost Book of Enke which also details this particular destruction. And so, if I can find it, I'm going to share with you a little bit of this particular story. And if you have any questions also, because Genesis covers all of this as well, talks about the destruction of the earth, the recreation of it. Uh, It speaks about... um, it speaks about how the Earth came to be in a new orbit and how it was reformed. You know, the dividing of the firmament, the waters from the waters below and the waters from the waters above. That that particular passage is a reference to this particular destruction. The Because what had happened in the way that the story, because all of the Babylonian, the Akkadian, these uh, ancient pagan cultures, they... Their epic creation story of how the earth came to be, like Genesis, gives elaboration and detail as to this story that was immortalized and that is very ancient, even unto the fallen angels that were witness to it. It was very, very ancient. Um and so, I'm going to, mm-hmm. let me check the chat room first. So this story details the recreation of the earth from from where it had been when it was this huge watery planet. And also that this watery planet named Tiamat, referenced in Job as Rahab, that this planet was... Um, Yes, Nibiru destroyed Tiamat, and that was the destruction of the first Earth. Yes, you're correct, Jose. And this planet used to be where the asteroid belt now is. And so the asteroid belt is a witness as to that great destruction that took place so long ago, as well as the asteroids and the comets that we found riddling our 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 solar system and also that the rings the rings of Saturn and the rings of other planets because other planets also have rings not as pronounced as Saturn does but they do have rings these rings are also the leftover debris field from that cataclysmic destruction which occurred a long time ago now if you cite and you read the Enuma Elish and great detail it will it will tell you the story of when Nibiru first was captured by the outer gaseous planets of our particular outer solar system and how when it was captured it was brought into conflict with Tiamat now this is cited as a war in heaven a long time ago a different war in heaven than the war of Lucifer and the rebel angels against that of the Most High and His Son. But this is also accounted as the war in heaven, and it's cited as 
the war between the the Lord of Hosts and the dragon Tiamat, and that is the the old creation stories according to the pagan nations, the these various pagan cultures, that they will tell you even though it does you know it's the particular planets are given godlike status and it's like a war between the angels. It's actually the story is depicting the early um, establishment of our solar system. And just to give you a little detail on that, I'm going to share a little bit of the story that you can find this this full entire accounting in my sixth book, Sons of God, Who We Are and Why We're Here. And after I read this, I will connect it to the passages that are referenced in Genesis chapter 1. And also in my sixth book, Sons of God, the first um, chapter, which is not really a chapter at all, it's it's the what I call the timeline for creation that I speak about and elaborate on Genesis. I break down the first seven days and I tell you what is happening and how it connects to these ancient accountings. And so I'm going to read from, this is a Sumerian accounting of the same thing. It says this. Now this is the account of the earth and its gold. It is an account of the beginning and how the celestial gods created were. In the beginning when in the above the gods in the heavens had not been called into being. And in the below, Ki, the firm ground, had not yet been named. Alone in the void there existed Apsu. Apsu is the sun. The primordial begetter. In the heights of the above, the celestial gods had not yet been created. In the waters of the below, the celestial gods had not yet appeared. The celestial gods being referred to here are the planetary bodies of this particular solar system. Above and below, the gods had not yet been formed. Destinies were not yet decreed. No reed had yet been formed. No marshland had appeared. Alone did Apsu, the sun, reign in the void. And then by his winds, the primordial waters were mingled. A divine and artful spell, Apsu upon the waters cast. On the void's deep, he poured a sound sleep. Tiamat, the mother of all, as a spouse for himself, he fashioned. So it's talking about this old earth coming into being. A celestial mother, a watery beauty she was indeed. Beside him, Apsu, little Mumu, who we know as Mercury, then brought forth, as his messenger, he him appointed a gift for Tiamat to present. A gift resplendent to a spouse, Apsu granted, a shining metal, the everlasting gold for her alone to possess. It is also speaking about how this particular planet has so much gold, whereas the other planets do not have a significant amount. Then it was that the two, their waters mingle, divine children betend them to bring forth. Male and female were the celestials created. Lamu, which is Mars, and Lahamu, which is Venus, by names they were called. In the below did Apsu and Tiamat make them an abode. Before then had grown in age and in stature. In the waters of the above, Anshar and Kishar, which are Saturn and Jupiter, were formed. I'm just going to read a little bit more of this, and then I'm going to go to the conflict. Um, Surpassing their brothers in size, they were. As a celestial couple, the two were fashioned. A son, An, in the distant heavens, was their heir. Then Antu, to be his spouse as An's equal, was brought forth. Those are the two outer planets. An and Antu represent Uranus and Neptune because they're very 
similar in aspect, and they're also watery planets. As a boundary of the upper waters, their abode was made. They were the three heavenly couples below and above in the depths created. By names they were called the family of Apsu, the family of the sun. With Mumu and Tiamat they formed. All right. So it's talking about the early creation of the planets. Now, I'll read a real quick passage that talks about how Nibiru was captured as a part of this particular solar system. At that tyrant, in the heart of the deep, a god was engendered. In a chamber of fates, a place of destinies, was he born. By an artful creator was he fashioned, the son of his own son he was. From the deep where he was engendered, the god from his family in a rushing departed. A gift of his creator, the seed of life, with him away he carried. It's talking about how this planet was already um, was already um, inhabited by the fallen ones. To the void he set his course, a new destiny he was seeking. The first to glimpse the wandering celestial was the ever watchful onto, which is talking about again Neptune. Um, and Uranus. Alluring was his figure, a radiance he was beaming. Lordly was his gait, exceedingly great was his course. Of all the gods, he was the loftiest, surpassing theirs in his circuit was. All right. So this is talking about the capture of, uh, of Nibiru and how it came to be part of this particular planet. Now I'm going to go ahead and talk about how it was brought into conflict with our planet Tiamat when it was where the asteroid belt now is. This is the accounting. Now this is the account of the celestial battle and how the earth led come to be. And of Nibiru's destiny, the Lord went forth his fated course he followed Toward the raging Tiamat he set his face. A spell with his lips he uttered. As a cloak for protection, he the pulser and the emitter put on. With a fearsome radiance his head was crowned. On his right he posted the smiter. On his left the repeller he placed. The seven winds his host of helpers like a storm he sent forth. The seven winds are the seven moons of Nibiru. Toward the raging Tiamat he was rushing, clamoring for battle. The gods thronged about him, and then from his path they departed. To scan Tiamat and her helpers alone was he advancing. The scheme of Kingu, which is the moon, our, our original moon, it's talking about this moon being with Tiamat, her host commander, talking about, because we had multiple moons back at that time, but Kingu, was our moon that we have now, was the largest of the moons that Tiamat had. Her host commander to conceive, when he saw valiant Kingu blurred become, became his vision, as he gazed upon the monster in his direction was distracted, his course became upset. His doing were confused. Tiamat's band tightly her encircled. With terror they trembled. Tiamat to her roots gave a shudder. A mighty roar she emitted. On Nibiru she cast a spell. Engulfed him with her charms. The issue between them was joined. The battle was unavoidable. Face to face they came. Tiamat and Nibiru. Against each other they were advancing. They for battle approached. They pressed on for single combat. The Lord spread his net, talking about gravity. To encompass her he cast it. With fury Tiamat, Tiamat cried out. Like one possessed she lost her senses. The evil wind which had been behind him, Nibiru drove forward. In her face he let it loose. She opened her mouth, the evil wind to swallow but could not close her lips. The evil wind charged her belly. 
into her innards it made its way. This is talking about one of the moons of Nibiru called the evil wind here and how it and it 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 destroyed well it will you know it hit the planet and it split it entered into the innards the the interior of the earth her innards were howling her body was disintended her mouth was open wide through the opening nibiru shot a brilliant arrow a lightning most divine it pierced her innards her belly it tore apart it tore into her womb. It split apart her heart. Having thus shuddered her, she opened her mouth. The evil went to swallow but could not close her lips. Oh, wait. I missed my place. Oh, sorry. Having thus subdued her, her life breathed, he extinguished. Her life breath he extinguished. The lifeless body of Nibiru surveyed like a slaughtered carcass Tiamat now was. So this is talking about after the the earth was destroyed as a planet, that it, it was completely annihilated. Beside their lifeless mistress, her eleven helpers trembled with terrors. In Nibiru's net they were captured. These are talking about the moons and how they were captured in the gravity um, the gravity of Nibiru and they were brought in you know they impacted the the planet they were driven into uh, or burned up in the um, the gravitational field of Nibiru in Nibiru's net they were captured unable they were to flee Kingu, who, had bed, who, had, who by Tiamat was made the host chief, was among them. The Lord put him in fetters. To his lifeless mistress he bound him. So this is speaking about our current moon and how that moon was attached, became, instead of, you know, because of its size, it wasn't driven into the planet of Nibiru, but it was... Um, it was attached, it was bound to the carcass of what would be the the new earth and the new coalescing of the earth. That's also why the moon, as we have it, is connected to, uh, in proportion, it's huge compared to the size of the earth now, whereas the planet used to be of so much greater size and that would, you know, in all the other planets of the solar system, the moons are more proportional to their size. But it's only because the Earth has been destroyed that we have such a large moon now. All right, continuing. He wrested from Kingu the tablets of destinies. Uprightly to him, unrightly to him were given. Stamped it with his own seal, fastened the destinies to his own chest. The others of Tiamat's band, as captives, he bound. In his circuit, he them ensnared. He trampled them underfoot and cut them up to pieces. He bound them all to his circuits. To turn around, he made them backwards to course. From the place of the battle, Nibiru then departed. To the gods who had him appointed the victory to announce. He made a circuit around the sun, Apsu, to Kishar and Anshar, that's uh, Saturn and Jupiter, lie journeyed. Gaga came out to greet him, that's Pluto. As a herald to the others, he then journeyed. All right. This is talking about the how the earth was moved to where the orbit it is now and how it recoalescing it became the perfect planet for what would be the replication of life and the recreation and the focus of Genesis you know Genesis 1 chapter 2 how the earth became null and void and then the rest of Genesis is talking about 
how the Father and the Son replicated life here on what was the reformed and recreated earth. So continuing, just a little bit more of this. Beyond, on, and on to, that's Neptune and Uranus. Nibiru to the abode in the deep proceeded. The fate of the lifeless Tiamat and Kingu, the moon, he then considered. To Tiamat, whom he had subdued, the Lord Nibiru then returned. He made his way to her, paused to view her lifeless body, to artfully divide the monster in his heart, life was plenty. Then, as a muscle into two parts, he split her. Her chest formed her lower parts. He separated her inner channels. He cut apart her golden veins. He beheld with wonder, trotting upon her hinder part. The Lord, her upper part, completely severed. The north wind, his helper, from his side he summoned to thrust away the severed head the wind he commanded, into the void to place it. Nibiru wind upon Tiamat then hovered, sweeping upon her gushing waters. Nibiru shot a lightning to north wind, he gave a signal. In a brilliance was Tiamat's upper part, to a region unknown carried. So part of the earth was just, it, it just was lost to space. The other part became what our current planet is. With her, the bound Kingu was also exiled, of the severed part a companion to be. The hinder part's fate Nibiru then considered, as an everlasting trophy of the battle he wished it to be, a constant reminder in the heavens, the place of the battle to enshrine. With his mace, the hinder part, he smashed the bits and pieces, then strung them together as band to form a hammered bracelet. The hammered bracelet is the asteroid belt. So that is one part of the Earth is where the hammered bracelet is. And all of the comets and the asteroid belt, the ast- I mean the asteroids, they come from that part of the Earth that was left there. The other part of the Earth was as we're about to go into, was moved to a new orbit, and the moon was also um, attached to this part of the planet. Locking them together as watchmen, he stationed them, a firmament to divide the waters from the waters. The upper waters above the firmament from the waters below it, he separated. Arful works Nibiru thus fashioned, The Lord then crossed the heavens to survey the region from Apsu's quarter to the abode of Gaga. He measured the dimensions, then strung them together as a band to form a hammered bracelet. Oh, wait. Again, I messed up. Um, He measured the dimensions. The edge of the deep, Nibiru then examined. Toward his birthplace, he cast his gaze. He paused and hesitated. And then to the firmament, the place of the battle, slowly he returned, passing again in Opsu's region. So this is the third circuit. This is the third orbit of Nibiru um, after the, the battle, after the destruction of the earth. Passing again in Opsu's region of the sun's missing spouse, he thought with remorse. He gazed upon Tiamat's wounded half. To her upper part he gave attention. The waters of life hid her bounty. From the wounds were still pouring. Her golden veins, Apsu's rays, were reflecting. The seed of his life, his creator's legacy. Nibiru then remembered when he trod on Tiamat, when he split her asunder. To her the seed he surely imparted. He addressed words to Apsu, to him thus saying, With your warming rays to the wounds give healing. Let the broken part new life be given. In your family as a daughter to be, let the waters to one place be gathered. Let firm land appear. See, this is also paralleling what is speaking about in Revelation, I mean in Genesis. 
Let the waters to one place be gathered. Let firm land appear. By firm land, let her be called Ki, henceforth her new name to be. Ki is what the Sumerians refer to as the new earth. Opso to the words of Nibiru gave heed. Let the earth join my family. Ki, firm land of the below, let earth be her name, henceforth forever be. By her turning, let their day and night be. In the days my healing rays to her I shall provide. Let Kingu be a creature of the night, that's the moon. To shine at night I shall appoint him, earth's companion the moon forever to be. Nibiru, the words of Apsu, with satisfaction heard. He crossed the heavens and surveyed the regions. To the gods who had him elevated, he granted permanent stations. So now it's talking about how after this destruction and how the earth, once it had uh, taken up its new orbital position, all of the planets became steady in their orbits. And there became calm and uh, and peace settled to the solar system after this great cataclysmic destruction and this war in heaven, which resulted in the reformation of the earth. All right, one final part here. Um to the gods who had him elevated, he granted permanent stations. Their circuits he destined that none shall transgress nor fall short of each other. He strengthened the heavenly locks. Gates on both sides he established. An outermost abode he chose for himself. Beyond Gaga, Pluto, were its dimensions. The great circuit to be his destiny he beseeched Apsu for him to decree. All the gods spoke up from their stations. Let Nibiru's sovereignty be surpassing. Most radiant of the gods he is. Let him truly the son of the sun be. From his quarter, Apsu gave his blessing. Nibiru shall hold the crossing of heaven and earth. Crossing shall be his name. The gods shall cross over neither above nor below. He shall hold the central position. The shepherd of the gods he shall be. A shar shall be his circuit. That his destiny will forever be. That's uh, chapters 46 through 54, the lost book of Enki. And so that story tells you also what I've been telling you uh, about Genesis and how in Genesis this same accounting is being given. Let me go back to that. Real quick. Also, for those that are interested, that's um, like page around page ninety in in my book, Sons of God. All right, but going back to the Genesis timeline. All right, going back to the Genesis timeline. I'm almost there. All right. Oh, here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That right there is referencing this battle, this war that took place in the heavens of which I just read the the most detailed and the most accurate accounting which you can find about this particular battle and event. And then the next passage it says, And God said, Let there be light. Oh, wait, I need to skip just a little bit. Talking about the separation of the firmaments. Okay, right here. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. 
So this event, the dividing of the firmament, the the the, the waters from the waters, that was the destruction of the planet Earth, and that the recreation of the Earth is what would be cited in the upcoming passages of Genesis. Just to verify this for you, let's go into the next passage. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And so you see how here, even with the accounting, uh, in the Sumerian accounting, it's talking about how the same thing as Genesis, that once the earth was destroyed, and that, you know, it used to be this planet with one giant ocean, and that part of the planet was destroyed and left where the asteroid belt is, that now the land could appear, that the waters would drain into what would be this deep crevice, this massive depression that was left over from this destruction. And that is where the Pacific Ocean now is that where all that massive, you know, amount of water, that's where this particular moon destroyed the old earth. And so all the waters of the ocean flowed into that deep crevice and that massive um, crater, and that's when the land began to appear. And once the land, the rivers took course, the lakes were also created, and the earth began to dry, then the the land hardened, and um, and also, you know, the multiplicity of life, which is also des- described in the upcoming chapters of Genesis, all that took place, and all and this earth was used by the Father and the Son for what would be the next chapter of the universe, and that chapter excuse me, is what is focused and referenced in the first book of the Torah, Genesis. And that Genesis chapters 1 through 3 are talking about this event. Also, for those that are interested, in my new book, Skyfall, I speak about all of this as well, and I detail in more elaboration the things that I began in the sons of God. Um, There is um, an alternate conversation going on in the chat room. And uh, Sea Tiger says, it makes sense that the giants are from the seraphim reptilian fallen angel offspring. That is indeed correct. And that the giants, when the watchers, As the second incursion that the rebel angels, they were banished here before modern creation of Adam and Eve, but that the watchers fell during the time of Yared, Enoch's father, and that they, when they came here, first they were put into male bodies of flesh, as cited by the Kebra Negras, chapter 100, and they were able to fornicate with the daughters of Cain, who were already hybrid beings. And that when they did so, the result of that copulation, that fornication, was the giants or the men of renown. But that the line of Cain, they were already hybrid. And they were the result of Eve being beguiled by the Nakash, who was, you know... uh, the Nakash was a feathered serpent, much like the depictions of the Sumerian gods, the Anunnaki, who were giant winged dragons, reptiles, winged reptiles, or seraphim angels, which are snake-like angels. Um, that also Satan, even though he was once a cherub, he was transformed and put into similar aspect. He was transformed into similar shape. And that's why it calls him the ancient dragon of old 
who led astray and deceiveth the whole world. And so all these things are connected to and tied together. Uh, we're out of time. I appreciate all of you taking the time to join me for this discussion. I hope that you found it interesting. And I hope that I elaborated on the story with these particular Sumerian scriptures, which I haven't read in a very long time. I have done previous shows uh, with them, but it's been several years now. But with me going into the show with John the Baptist tomorrow night and also with the show that I just did this past Wednesday detailing all of this, I wanted to give you the the scriptures in detail so that you can understand what is being referred to and referenced in Genesis. So that when I speak about this tomorrow night, and when you listen to the show that I did this past Wednesday, you'll understand in greater detail how it is and why it is that I've come to this particular discernment. And so with that, good night all. God bless. May the Father and the Son watch over you. Keep you safe and lead you and guide you in discernment and lead you to revelation that will help you to come to remembrance on who you are, why you're here, and what all of this is about. God bless all.